and I'm very glad that uh, I can introduce this master class of Friedrich Thor Friedrichsson, who is a famous Icelandic filmmaker, and uh, I think he doesn't need any introduction. Uh, he will talk about his films, personal history, I guess, and and let's start with the master class. Uh, my first question will be about uh, your early steps into cinema and can you start from this late 70s or maybe later yeah thank you and, uh, <laughs> and uh, like my mother used to say if I invited for dinner thank you for having me <laughs> uh, well I started by running a film society. Uh, it was during college years, and uh, and then um, I um, I was. It was a rather small film club, uh, but I I made it really big. I had like almost two thousand five hundred members. And uh, this was before video was invented, so so we got most of the films in sixteen mil, and um, and I had the privilege to choose almost every film I wanted to see. So we were showing like three hundred films a year, and sometimes three films a day and uh, that was my film school and my education by because I was also the projectionist sometimes and uh, but I usually if this was the cinema I, uh, then I was sitting there because most of the films were dread boring and uh, so people wouldn't walk out because then I gave them a very bad <laughs> <laughs> so people are still afraid of me still today because they didn't dare to go out then and, and uh, some people got sick because the cinema was very old and the roof was leaking so it was a perfect conditions for films like Stalker by Tarkovsky and uh, and yeah, so people got sick, and and they blamed it on me. And um, but I educated a lot of people. They are very grateful for that because at that time there was no possibilities to uh, to see a different films uh, because we got the martial help after the Second World War and. And uh, each studio, American studio, had its own cinema, and, and they were not even allowed to show uh, so, so what non American films. So, and uh, there was only one TV station, and that was from the NATO base. So it was, uh, we were really dominated by the Americans. But uh, it was also good because the uh, uh, they had a radio station that was pr broadcasting rock and roll music and there was only one radio station and they were just broadcasting uh, uh, classical music and they had only they had only like three three hours every week when when uh, they were uh, broadcasting uh, rock and roll music and uh, and um, and I learned later on that that was the only thing that the Russian um, sailors in the nuclear submarines they were always aiming uh, they are still aiming uh, nuclear bombs at the domestic airport and the NATO airport of course and uh, they were always hiding under some small fishing boats and they had to listen just to 
what the fisherman was listening to. Otherwise, the raider from the NATO base would catch them. So they knew by heart. It was really funny to meet those guys because uh, they they knew by heart all these Icelandic songs. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, because they had to stay there for one month under those fishing boats and and listen to this boring, boring, boring broadcast. <laughs> and can you tell something about your first film? Yeah, my first film was, um, well, I made a lot of experimental films on eight millimeters, but, uh, but, uh, and I'm very happy that they are all lost because uh, <laughs> I tried to, I tried to um, uh, get into a film school in Roma, Cinecita, and uh, I sent them my application, and it was a huge box with all kinds of stuff that I have done. And um, and then I got a phone call like three months later from the uh, Iceland Air, and they were saying that your package is on an auction in Roma if you uh, if you don't uh, pay for the return and I didn't have the money to to pay for the return so <laughs> someone in Rome has my masterpieces you know <laughs> <laughs> and um, and but uh, the first film that that uh, really was a also a kind of a experimental film and um, and uh, because both uh, <laughs> it was a, uh, the composer who was here with a master class Hilmar Hilmarsson he was uh, he was uh, we are we are great friends from childhood and uh, and the uh, one thing that is completely holy in Iceland are the sagas. They are written on cow skin in the 13th century. And the most famous saga is the burning of Njal saga. And, and me and Hilmar, we, we did some kind of a joke. Uh, I thought it was a joke, but it turned out to be dead serious stuff. <laughs> And I, we started to announce, I had a press meeting saying that I was going to film this brand new saga. And, uh, and, um, and at that time there was only one radio station, like I said earlier, and so everybody was listening to the announcements. So I, uh, I put a, a ads like, don't go to this place because we are filming there, this Brennanial saga. And, uh, but people, of course, were flocking to see this because this is the dream of the nation to see this on a white screen. But nobody asked me how I got the money to make this film. So what I, what I did, I announced there will only be one screening and I tripled the price. And it was sold out immediately. <laughs> and uh, and uh, what I did, I, I just shot uh, the book page to page. <laughs> and the climax of the story uh, is when they put fire into the into Niel's farm. And on the same page, I put fire into the book. <laughs> And uh, and uh, it was screened on a on a uh, the biggest cinema in Iceland, a thousand seats, and <laughs> and all the experts in the sagas came, and they were <laughs> in wheelchairs and because uh, <laughs> they had to see this before they <laughs> left. <laughs> And uh, and it, it was really, and and uh, Hilmar and his group pair 
they played live under, so it was like a rock concert also. And the old people, of course, were terrified. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I took a taxi the day after, and then I noticed that I was not welcome in the city. <laughs> because the taxi driver told do you know what happened last night? <laughs> Some idiot, he, he fooled the whole nation. <laughs> and uh, I would kill him if I see him, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I met Ari Christison, who is also here, uh, who shot most of my films. And I, I told him that I, I was loaded with cash and he was coming out of production and they couldn't pay him. But they they said uh, they had a camera and Nakra so they can he could we could take a camera. So I said, okay, we, we should just buy some uh, footage and and go out <laughs> to the countryside and shoot that film with this blacksmith, and we shot that. Okay, we, we can show a clip from it. If I was a painter, uh, this was like a sketch for a film called Children of Nature, because that was the only film we showed the main actor from Children of Nature, and we wanted to have the same atmosphere in that film as as it uh, is in this film. So this guy was a wonderful guy, uh, inventor, and he. He could change a clock to a calendar and uh, did all kinds of. He made the bike with f with more than one gear, and he had touch with supernatural elements also. He, when he needed the help, he got it from, I think, some elves or hidden people. And uh, so I think there supernatural became very very natural for me because uh, yeah and uh, also also I think for me it was very important to make this film before because uh, when you are making documentary then you are just catching atmosphere and and uh, and when you are making a feature film then you're always trying to create an atmosphere but but uh, you learn so much when you are catching atmosphere because you know what creates the atmosphere. But can you tell more about uh, how to get money to make a film that time? Because your first film, Brennu Nial Saga, was a huge success, as you said. So was it easy to get m money for it? And uh, can you tell more about the subsidy system in Iceland that time? No, I, I, I think <laughs> it was. Uh, I think I made uh, four or five films without any support, uh, probably because of Brennan Yalsa, because uh, that was like a terrorist act. <laughs> but uh, but um, uh, I also founded the Reykjavik Film Festival seventy seven. I'm a very old man, you know, so, and, uh, 
and in connection with that, the Icelandic Film Fund was funded. So there was a guy who was a minister of culture. He had only seen one film in his life, <laughs> and it was a short film. <laughs> and uh, and we had only we had only budget to invite invite one guest, and it was the inventors who came with. Uh, American friend and the minister of culture, he said uh, he just passed away 105 years old, but he, I met him quite often and he said, Frederick, you are responsible for the long film I had to see, this <laughs> American friend, <laughs> because well, he was the minister of culture, so he had to be at the opening, so he was forced to see the film. <laughs> He passed away only seeing two, two films in his life. <laughs> and uh, Wim is a little bit responsible because uh, he wrote a letter to the members of the parliament and told them to create a, a film fund. And, and they took him seriously and, 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 and then the fund was funded. So he is He's a little bit like creator of uh, Frankenstein. It's uh, easy to create, but hard to control. And now do you want to show Children of Nature and the scene? So you saw uh, he walked just like the old man in blacksmith. But this was uh, in '91. Let's go back. So uh, after blacksmith, you stayed on the countryside. Or what, what, what was your next step? Oh, I don't remember. No, uh, we we 
we founded a company, uh, me uh, and the cameraman, Ari, and the soundman, and we started to shoot uh, Rock in Reykjavik uh, almost immediately when we came back. Eight, eight, 81. So uh, Rock in Reykjavik was before Icelandic Cowboys? Yeah. Or? Okay. And do you want to show some clip from it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, it was uh, it was uh, the punk arrived rather late to Iceland, so I think uh, this was the end of the punk period in Iceland, eighty one. Uh, but there was a huge uh, power in this uh, generation. It was a lot of uh, live music. Concert, live concerts all over town, um, and it has never stopped. Really, it's. I think it's still like that. There's a lot of creativity in music in Iceland, much more than in films, and uh, and we have endless bands who are world famous now, and uh, and uh, I think. This film really uh, proved for themselves that because uh, that they could be really big when they saw themselves on a big screen, and uh, and we have uh, footage of Björk, for example, when he's fourteen or fifteen years old. You want to show that? Yeah, if you want to. <laughs>
Yeah, and uh, and uh, we we had problems with censorship. <laughs> they cut out uh, ten minutes, and um, I was in Italy when it was broadcasted, and then they, I think they cut even more when it was broadcast on television. And it was a. Uh, we were very unlucky because uh, there was an election for the city and the right-wing party. Uh, they had this woman who was very nice, and but she was also the chairman of the censorship. And uh, and she was she was um, uh, trying to win back the city from the left, so. And uh, she was very unpopular <laughs> because she, uh, this was only interviews she cut out and banned. So I, I uh, was the most stupid situation I've ever been to. But uh, but uh, yeah, but uh, the film was really uh, I think twenty seven thousand people saw it in cinemas. So that's almost ten percent of the nation. So, <laughs> so yeah, but we thought that forty thousand would see it. And <laughs> we were very optimistic, but uh, yeah, it was. Uh, it was. We can say it was a successful film, but um, and again, it was not supported uh, by the government at all. And it was the first Dolby stereo film in Scandinavia. <laughs> and uh, was very funny. And, uh, yeah. Well, that's not so much to say of the film. Okay, I have another clip if you want to see another song from this. Oh, hey. Hey! Oh, yeah.
let's move from Reykjavik to Akureyri. And there was your next film made. Can you talk something about Icelandic cowboys? Or should we show? Yeah, well, <laughs> that, that was another coincidence. I, I was sick and I was listening to this boring radio station. <laughs> and, uh, and then this guy came and uh, and he was a projectionist of one it's a it's in a small village and he was showing so many american films that he his dream was to become a country singer <laughs> and he succeeded and uh, and uh, so he uh, was advertising on this radio program uh, uh, country festival he was going to have in his village and half of the people in the village were dressed up like cowboys but the other half hated him <laughs> and and uh, the whole program sounded how he was describing it was a, like a script for me so I just I went with uh, four cameras and and we shot this film during one weekend. I have two clips again, so let's start with the concert and yeah. then okay. nice. Okay. Ég held bara enginn geti 
Maybe tell first why do you want to show the mass, or because uh, the mass is something that I think it was unbelievable. I, I was shooting on one of the cameras, but I had to stop shooting, and and I didn't know where it, it was like. It says uh, the Wild West is here. Uh, it's burnt on, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I think. Uh, if God exists, then he had a performance there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I will play this. Þannig að Hattbjörn að fara að syngja fyrir okkur 
og með okkur lægið og kórinn ætlar að syngja við lægið og ég vil hvetja ykkur öll til þess að taka vel undir ef þið ekki nú þegar kunni lægið þá lærið það fljótt og verið þið nú með okkur takið þið vel undir
myrkur grúði yfir djúpinu og andi Guðs sveif yfir vöknunum. Guð sagði, verði ljós og það verði ljós. Guð sá að ljósið var gott og Guð greindi ljósið frá myrkrinu og Guð kallaði ljósið dag en myrkrið kallaði hann nótt. This is my favorite scene of all scenes here. <laughs> and um, I, I was, people were very drunk during this weekend. <laughs> and uh, a lot of people were calling me and they were asking to be not cut out of the film because they didn't know what that was. They wanted to be wiped out of the film <laughs> because uh, most of the women are married to sailors, so they were having an affair with another people, and so it was, was uh, caused a lot of problem, this film. <laughs> and what about the success of the film in cinemas, and economical success as well? Yeah, well, it was, I was very lucky. It was two days after the premiere, it was a strike, so there was no television. So people were flocking to see this film. <laughs> Maybe now we can start with first Q&A because then uh, the next film is quite different from these two music films. So does anyone have any question? If not, we will continue. Um, you were you mentioned that uh, you started making um, eight millimeter experimental films, but they were lost. But I was wondering if you could at least uh, describe what they were like, if you remember. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was a lot of frame by frame stuff and uh, changing the Icelandic flag to American flag a star in America, blah, 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 blah. blah. <laughs> uh, we were just 40 years old when we were doing this. And, uh, and, and I think one was quite nice. Uh, it was, uh, it was, I took, uh, uh, there was a chapter in a English uh, book, uh, how to how to learn English, blah blah blah, and so it was just like a script. It was uh, people were sitting and and they were uh, uh, organizing the future so future of a young couple because they were going to get married, and uh, and we were very heavily influenced by the surrealist surrealistic films, so. So we, because uh, uh, we were also working with, uh, I was also running a gallery <laughs> later on, and this was kind of a, and they were saying the future of uh, what they should get as a wedding gift, blah, 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 blah. And then, for example, one scene that when we put all kinds of uh, instruments people use uh, in kitchen, on a naked back of this woman. <laughs> so it was just like an animated film. And, uh, and um, one film was uh, about Jesus Christ coming to um, town. <laughs> and, uh, and it was shot in a minus 10 and Jesus changed his words completely because he was asking because he was on the cross <laughs> and he was asking if he can have his socks on because it was <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I remember more from the shooting than the film really <laughs> and but this was a brilliant film <laughs> uh, um, it was, uh, you know, it was the only thing we were th politically very well. Uh, we we had 
our main enemy was the NATO base. And so most of the films had something to do with that, to be against this NATO base. And uh, yeah, but but uh, but also yeah, a lot of frame by frame uh, stuff. Uh, I will show the fir the next clip, the, the circle, the beginning of the film, and then we can talk about this experimental movie. Only thing I remember about this film was a, there was a 94 years old woman who came up to me and she was so grateful because she thought she would not live to go on the east side of the country, but now she did. <laughs> How did the idea to make this film come from? Or from I, I think it was uh, I made. Uh, made eight millimeter film um, very similar to this but uh, there was a man in the middle 
of the of the frame. So it was really an old old idea, and it was the idea was to be on the speed of sound around in eighty minutes, like around to blah 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 blah. That. But uh, we connected the camera to uh, the speed meter, so every twelve meters it took one frame. So it was very easy and was it really one day drive or no two uh, I have another clip from this film here uh, more further from Reykjavik <laughs> Shot 84, and uh, the roads were terrible at that time. But now it's very smooth. So Maybe they can make it in one day, two days. Yes, it's possible. It was shot during the September or something. But uh, of course, you can shoot uh, for 24 hours in June. And what happened? after this because your next documentary uh, came more than 20 years after this so-called documentary and the circle so why you moved to fiction films only well my first fiction film was kind of a documentary about whaling it's uh i had a very tough editor thomas gislason and uh, he was last month's three-year editor also. Uh, they were friends. And sometimes they are still friends. And uh, 
And uh, even though he has an Icelandic name, he doesn't speak Icelandic, Thomas. And uh, uh, he cut my first film uh, down to a short film. So I, I was really shocked because he didn't have any sense for pauses and stuff like that. And, um, instead of, we thought that uh, we had a good material for a for f feature length fiction film. Uh, then he cut it down to like one hour. So what I did, I it's based on a true events that really took place in Iceland. Uh, it was be uh, for. Uh, Police was armed, and uh, so it was about uh, the real event. Was about two drunk s sailors that broke into a sport magazine and started a shootout, and they shot on everything they saw, and uh, and the terrorist police was funded after this event. So. Uh, and it's a very good example of reality is much more surrealistic than than the film because it was uh, unbelievable stuff and uh, it was just like in a comic film even though nobody was killed but uh, very close and uh, and in in real life, they went out. Uh, they went out of the magazine, sport magazine, and there was interview, for example, with guys. They, it was uh, eight o'clock on Saturday morning, and uh, people were going to work. And then suddenly, one guy saw two guys with shotguns aiming at him, <laughs> and. He didn't know what was going on, and, and they shot down all the all the windows in the his car, <laughs> and the only thing he said, "You are very cool guys." <laughs> <laughs> and then there was a guy coming out of his door, and he saw what was going on, and then he saw an old woman who was carrying out the newspaper, and. He said in an interview, the first thing I had to do was to save this woman's life. So he attacked her and dragged her into the basement of his house. And, but she thought he was a rapist. So, <laughs> <laughs> so he ended up breaking three bones in her body. <laughs> so, but I, I didn't use that because I thought it was like a comic uh, stuff. And uh, yeah, but uh, the beginning of the film is just like a documentary of whaling. And, and it, it has the purpose because people didn't believe uh, the story. But if you st start it with very much like a documentary, <laughs> plain documentary, then it is more believable. forms of autism, such as Asperger's syndrome, has always been here. Uh, they've always been here. That's not increased. That's just increased diagnosis. Where I think there has been some increase is some of this very severe autism, especially the form of autism where the kid seems to be normal, and then at age two, they lose their language and they regress. Hi, Daddy. 
Hi, Taylor. How are you? I'm fine. Are you happy? Happy and sad. Oh, I don't think you're sad. You're happy. I'm, I'm happy. It is one of the most heartbreaking experiences where a parent is, uh, has a child who's developing normally and then somewhere between the first and the second year of life the child loses their skills. Um, it used to be that regression was only something that parents reported and scientists wondered whether it was actually a true phenomenon or maybe the parents weren't noticing those early symptoms. So we actually published a study a couple of years ago and what we did was to study home videotapes uh, of babies that were videotaped uh, in the home at their first and second birthdays. And we found that, in fact, at one year of age, that baby did look normal. That baby was babbling and pointing and then lost those skills. So we know this is a real phenomenon. It was a week or two after Taylor's third birthday. And it was in our kitchen. Uh, we were having breakfast one morning. Taylor was just a little bit over three years old. And suddenly, he looked at me dropped his spoon to the floor and started screaming, my mouth won't say the words, my mouth won't say the words, my daddy, daddy, my mouth won't say the words. And I had no idea what was going on. I, it, it, it floored me, I didn't understand it. He'd been a perfectly normal child and over the next six months, all of his language skills essentially evaporated. It is as if your child has been stolen from you. W once you said that in your films you try to avoid too much talking and you want to say everything possibly by image. And it's uh, 2009 and you made uh, this documentary, uh, Sunshine Boy, mainly based on interviews. Uh, why? I, I think it was just a very important subject and and also because uh, people don't know anything about it so uh, you have you have to almost educate everyone uh, because autism is such a taboo in our societies and uh, I think there's only one place uh, maybe you know, because you need a lot of money to uh, take care of autistic children and autistic people. And uh, California is one of the richest parts of the world, and and they are treating treating uh, the, the kids there in a very nice way, I would say. But um, I, when I started to make this film, I didn't know much about autism, even though uh, in Iceland, the film I made 2004, uh, the main characters are supposed to be autistic. But uh, uh, then uh, the mother of this autistic boy who was the main character in the film, he, he, she approached me with this idea to make a pure educational film. And because uh, in Iceland, for example, you have to wait for three years to find someone to make a to to uh, to diagnose you uh, your child, and then nothing happened after your child had been diagnosed with uh, as an autistic child, and then you wait another three years for a treatment. And uh, and it's a horrible. Uh, her, uh, these people are just heroes, you know. And uh, and uh, and she thought I was a very snobbish guy, the mother. I mean, and that I didn't want to make this film, and and uh, and she, I said, uh, just invite me to a dinner and and I want to see your child. And I saw 
I saw a person and and then I just said, if you are the main characters in the film, uh, then I will make the film. And, and she decided to do so. And, uh, and it's been very, very uh, successful film because Kate Winslet narrated it and uh, Sigur Rós made the score or and, and everybody donated. I worked like four and a half year uh, without being paid on this film and and uh, Sigur Rós gave the music and Björk and uh, and Kate also. And then it was, I think, sold uh, all over. And in America it's shown like 40 million people have seen it in, in America. HBO put it. And, uh, but the main thing is that uh, the boy, he started to communicate us when we were shooting <laughs> and it was just like a, watching a miracle through the lens because I was on one on the camera if you can show that I often get asked if I could snap my fingers would I want to be not be autistic no I wouldn't because autism is what I am I like my clarity of thought where there's other people where I think a few more emotional circuits are hooked up where they hate being autistic because they want to be more social. I'm content to be pure geek techie, and I get social interaction through shared interests. You know, shared interests is what makes my social world go along. It's not, you know, social chit chat. <coughs> I've often wondered what would a totally normal brain be like? It might be really boring. After the first trip to Austin, we were so incredibly proud of our little guy. There was a total change of attitude at home. Before, we used to talk about Kaylee in front of him, but now we talk to him. It's been six months since Kaylee first came to Soma. The aim of the second trip was to have Kaylee begin spelling and using a letterboard. No words can describe how wonderful it is to see him start communicating on his own instead of being imprisoned by his autism. And now finally, after more than 10 years, I can start to get to know my child. Four times 10 is 14 or 40. Sure, hold that. 40 would be good. In 40, we, we have to do a little work from this side to that side. But we can always practice. No harm practicing. On that, we, we, are not going to, we, we are not going to hesitate like that. Let's see. On that. Get it? I know you're trying your best because this, this corner is difficult sometimes. Four, you got it. And now, I don't think zero would be that difficult. Move your elbows. There. See, when, when, when we work, when we point accurately, all these joints, you have a joint over here, you have a joint over here, you have a joint over here, this and this, five joints have to work so that you may, you may, you may aim accurately and that is why a lot of practice needs to be done like that. Because just thinking and knowing is not enough. We have to show what we know because that is what, otherwise what would happen? People won't understand us. So you have to know and then show what you know. That is it. With a child with autism, they can't screen out. For example, I can screen out the sound of a car and I can still proceed. Whereas with a child with autism, all the different smells and sights and everything are ca coming with equal intensity. And the screening process is not there. And because that is not there, the overwhelming sense comes. And that is why they, they try to self-stimulate themselves as a defense mechanism to uh, to shut out the external st stimulation that are overwhelming their neurons, their nerves, and they start uh, self-stimulating to calm themselves down. Come on. CA. Hmm. And can, okay? Can. Okay? Keep going. I, okay? Can I? Can I? 
ओके ओके एल ओके एल कीप गोइंग ऑन दैट एल ई ओके एल ई गुड कीप गोइंग एल ई गेट इट ए ओके एल ई ए गुड कम ऑन आर गुड कीप गोइंग and can i learn okay what would you like to learn l e a r n learn p okay p good keep going i okay p i good keep going p i p i p i b does make any sense okay let's let's try on this p i sure come on P I keep going. A okay. P I A. That that would be a good idea. Come on, keep going. N good. Keep going. P I A N keep going. On on that on that. Lift lift your elbows up. Keep going. Oh piano. I think you can because just like letter board, you have the positions. In piano also you have the positions. And if you can memorize the position over here, you can memorize a position. piano just like you are touching the letter board things i think the piano it can be trans yeah that would be funny right that would be fun piano like that on that i okay i here m okay wait wait wait, wait. i i know you're getting stressed out m good keep going a good keep going hold it i map m a p map oh is it m a p or k okay wait m a p or m a k let me see come on let's see okay m a k good let let's finish that word m a k good lift lift your elbows up i make yes like that make okay s okay good keep going s keep going keep going o okay keep going n okay good s o n keep going s o n hold that g okay oh in your mind you make songs okay that you you want let off yeah. s o n g songs i make songs so you make different kinds of music in your mind and then you would like to bring them out on piano that that would be a good thing yeah i make so this is the first thing he asked this world uh, if i was able to learn how to play piano because he has been composing since he was a child that comes later on <laughs> so and he is he is now in austin this guy and he is in school with a normal kids uh or guys and uh, they give four uh, that's the highest score and he is he has four in everything <laughs> he is very 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 clever guy and and he is composing and uh, everybody wants to work with him uh he will have a concert soon in uh in new york in carnegie hall and even madonna wanted to work with him blah blah blah, blah. <laughs> so so and uh, but in iceland he was in school with the retarded children so uh, so uh, because you should never trust your eyes when you look at people I think the time is almost over. Uh do you have any questions? Uh there is one question. Um what would you say motivates you to make film? If you could put it into a sentence, what what is it that motivates you? Pain. <laughs> would you like to uh explain a bit further if you have an idea for a film it's very painful to have it inside your head 
So most of my filmmaking is just aspirin filmmaking. <laughs> you have to get rid of it, you know. Okay, could you please introduce your last documentary film, uh, which will be screened after this masterclass? Yeah, it's a film uh, uh, about a painter, and he was not only a painter, he was like a philosopher as well, and a poet. And uh, and he passed away uh, running a marathon, and uh, but uh, we had a lot of stuff in common, uh, especially how we how uh, he paints uh, landscape, for example, and how I film landscape. But uh, but it's a film that. Well, he, 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 there's nothing to say about it. He, 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 he uh, is talking all the time, the subject. And, uh, and this film also changed people's lives. So, like, like the Sunshine Boy. And, uh, and the price for his paintings are skyrocketing now. <laughs> and it was very good for the widow. <laughs> okay, I, I think the time is over. So thank you very much for your time and nice master class. And <laughs> maybe see you next time here in Ihlava. Oh, thank you.